Welcome to the Mathematics 23 Review Slides by the UP Mathematics Club. Here, we will be discussing absolute extrema and Lagrange multipliers. So a quick introduction to absolute extrema. On a given region D that satisfies certain conditions for a function f, that function will always have absolute maximum and absolute minimum values. So let's discuss how to solve some of these problems. So we have the first problem, find the absolute extrema of the function f of xy is equal to 1 minus x squared y squared minus x minus y on the region bounded by the following points. So before we get into solving this problem, I'll let you guys think about it and pause the video. Okay, so before we actually start solving the problem, let's look at this region. Because when finding the absolute extrema of the function, it's important to understand what the boundaries look like. And we won't understand how the boundaries look like without drawing the region itself. So we have these three points, 0, 0, negative 2, 0, and 0, negative 2. So the most obvious way to connect them would be through a triangle. And this region also includes the inner part. So let's shade that in with blue. So that's what our region looks like. It has three boundaries, the x-axis, or part of it, part of the y-axis, and then this diagonal line. So now that we understand what our region looks like, let's go into the solution. Starting with the extreme value theorem. So this extreme value theorem is very important. Because if we did not have the extreme value theorem, we could not guarantee the existence of our absolute extrema. We could be looking over the whole region and find nothing. So to use this EVT, we first have to check that our region is closed and bounded. So closed just means that it includes the boundaries, which they are included in red here. And bounded just means that the region is completely surrounded by the boundaries in simple terms. So the entire plane, the entire Cartesian plane, would not be bounded, for example. So now that we've shown that D is closed and bounded, we can apply the EVT to show that we will find absolute maximum and absolute minimum values. So how will we find them, though? Well, we can look in three places, which I've color-coded. This blue inner region, the red boundaries, and the green intersection points of those boundaries. So these three parts comprise the entire region. So it's guaranteed that our absolute extrema are found on at least one of these parts. So how will we go about this? Well, for the blue and red parts, or the, the, the inner region and the boundaries, we have to check their critical points, their critical points. And then for this green region, we just have to check all of the points of intersection. Note that our points of intersection can sometimes be critical points. So in that case, just don't be surprised if they come up early. So now let's move on, starting with inside the region. So we do this in the same way that we do relative maxima. Namely, we get the partial derivatives of our function. And then we find the x and y values that satisfy these equations when we equate the partial derivatives to 0. So we can find these x and y values first by subtracting these two equations. We can factor out 2xy to get this. And then we have three solutions, x equals 0, y equals 0, and x equals y. But before we can conclude that these are solutions, let's first go back to our original equation and check if they do indeed satisfy them. If we check x equals 0 and y equals 0, we'll actually see that it gets this equation, this we'll actually see that it gets this result, negative 1 equals 0, which is obviously not true. So x equals 0 and y equals 0 cannot be solutions to this equation. Um, these, are, these solutions are called extraneous solutions, and they can occur when we have systems of equations. And that's why it's important to check all of the solutions that we get in order to make sure that they actually satisfy the original equation. So what about x equals y? If we, if we substitute x equals y, we get another equation, 2x cubed is equal to negative 1, which we can solve for x as 
negative cube root of 1 half. And since x equals y, we get y is equal to negative cube root of 1 half. So this is our first critical point, and thankfully it's within the region. It's possible for us to get critical points that are outside of the region, so it's important to always check whether our critical points lie inside or outside of the region. So now that we're done with our blue inner region, we can move on to the red boundaries. So the strategy for our boundaries is to take this equation of the boundary, for example, for the x-axis, our equation of the curve is y equals 0. And then we substitute this into our function to get a function of only one variable. For example, if we replace y with 0 in our f of x, y, we get this new function alpha of x, which is equal to 1 minus x. So then we have to look for the critical points of this function. But we also have to be aware that our x has to be in this interval. If we get a critical point that's not in this interval, then we just disregard it. So in order to find the critical points, we just use the methods from Math 21. We just take the derivative to get negative 1. And then we note that negative 1, again, does not equal 0. And this means that there are no critical points. Now remember, we also had a portion of the y-axis, and the solution will be very similar. Except this time, we get a function of y, beta of y, which also has no critical points. So, so far, we found no critical points. But what if we check that diagonal line, this diagonal line over here? Well, first, we have to find the equation of the line. I'll leave it to you guys to verify that the equation of the line is this. And then we replace every instance of y in our f of x, y with negative 2 minus x. That will leave us with a pretty complicated expression. But if we do the legwork and try to simplify it, and then take the derivative, we'll see that we actually get pretty simple critical points. We get x equals 0, x equals negative 1, and x equals negative 2, all of which are within our interval over here. Now, the corresponding y values for these are y equals negative 2 for this one, y equals negative 1, and y equals 0. You can get these just by substituting x here. So now we have three more critical points. That makes four total. So we now have to consider our green intersection points. But thankfully, of our green intersection points, two of them are already here. So we just have to add one more point, the origin, 0, 0. And then we have our complete list of critical point candidates. So I'll go through this table, which actually has all the values. And we just have to pick out the highest value and the lowest value. So clearly, 1 is the lowest value here, because this is 1 plus something positive. So 1 is definitely smaller than that. So this is our absolute minimum. As for the absolute maximum, we note that this expression, 3 over 2, cube root of 2, that's more or less slightly smaller than 3 halves. So overall, this is 5 halves because 1 plus 3 halves is 5 halves. So this is slightly bigger than 2, but it's also smaller than 3. So because it's smaller than 3, we know that 3 is the absolute maximum value. When stating your conclusion, it's important to note what the problem is asking for. The problem could be asking for the absolute minimum value and the points where it occurs, or just the absolute minimum value. So that wraps up problem one. So problem two goes into Lagrange multipliers. So we need to use the method of Lagrange multipliers to find the shortest distance from the point 0, 3, 0 to the plane 3y minus c minus x equals 1. So before I go into the solution, I'll let you guys pause the video and think about it for yourselves. I think it's more clear if we reword the problem as use the method of Lagrange multipliers to find the shortest distance from this plane to this point. So we're looking for the point on this plane that has that is the closest to 0, 3, 0, and then we'll look for the distance between those two points. So now we have to find the shortest distance. But to do that, we have to be able to calculate the distance from any point to our, our given point, 0, 3, 0. So we define this function over here. So before we continue, I'd like to note that this f of x, y, z is not the distance, but the distance squared. 
because the distance is a positive quantity, the distance squared, we can just look for the smallest value of the distance squared, and that will also correspond to the smallest value of the distance. And then we have our constraint curve, which is just basically the equation of the plane from earlier, except instead of a constant, we equate this to our function, g of x, y, z. So that for the method of Lagrange multipliers, we take these two functions, f and g, and we have this system. The gradient of f is equal to lambda times the gradient of g. Then we look for the points which solve this system. So I'll leave it to you guys to verify that the gradients are actually correct. And we'll also add a fourth equation, which is the equation of our plane. So this is our system of equations for the Lagrange multipliers. So how will we go about solving this? Well, there are many ways to go about this. But for us, we first solve for lambda in terms of x. So we get so from 1, we simply multiply both sides by negative 1. To get lambda equals negative 2x. And then if we replace the lambda in 3 with negative 2x, we get 2z is equal to negative 2x times negative 1. 2z is equal to 2x, or x is equal to z. Now, if we take the, the first and second equations and replace x with z and lambda with negative 2x, then we get these two equations. This is now a system of equations of two variables, which has two equations. So we can solve for y and z explicitly here. So we do this by taking, so we multiply this by 3 times 3. And then we get 9y minus 6z equals 3. Then we can just add these two equations to get 11y equals 9. And that's how we get y is equal to 9 over 11. Now, if we go back to our equation 5, so if we substitute our y equals 9 over 11 here, plus 6z equals 6, then we just get 18 over 11 plus 6z equals 6. We can divide both sides by 6 to get 3 over 11, 3 over 11 plus z equals 1. So z is just 1 minus 3 over 11, which we will show in the next slide. So z is just 1 minus 3 over 11, or 8 over 11. z is 8 over 11. But since x is equal to z, we get x equals 8 over 11. So, these, so this x, y, and z, that's not the final answer yet. We have to substitute this into f. And then let's remember that f is d squared. So then we take the square root of f after we substitute d. So let's show this on the slide. So we have, here's what I described earlier. And this will result in 64 over 11. Now we still have to take the square root. The square root of 64 over 11 is this. To get this, we have to multiply the numerator and the denominator by the square root of 11. And the square root of 64 is 8. So this is our final answer. The shortest distance from the point 0, 3, 0 to the plane 3y minus z minus x equals 1 is 8 square root of 11 over 11.